good to be home. It's good to be with you. If you were here last week, you saw a little video that I, that I, that I shot from Ireland. And uh, I was able to spend a week with my dad. He turned 70 on September 28th. And his request was that uh, the, the sons and daughters would, would join him uh, in Ireland. And so uh, we went. And what a time it was to spend with dad. What a, what a time it was to spend with my brothers and sisters. Uh, we hadn't been together like that in 10 years. And uh, what, what, a, what a time it was. And so I, I'm so thankful for that. I will, I'll cherish that. I'll hold that close. Um, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful for you, uh, church, for allowing uh, me to even to do that and spend time with dad and my brothers and sisters. One of the things that I, I noticed as we were going from ruin to ruin is most of these ruins were uh, old churches. And, uh, and there was just walls left. There were just walls left. There were just, just, just rocks, just rubble in most of these sites. And I was so clearly reminded that the church is not a building. It's not an address. It's not a landmark that the church is believers. It's you and me together on mission for the Lord Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. I love buildings. I'm thankful for buildings. We prayed for this building for many a years. People in the church worked tirelessly, gave sacrificially. And I'm so thankful for what the Lord is doing in and through this building. It's a resource. It's a tool to advance his kingdom. I'm thankful for the coffee shop that's opening during the week and gospel conversations that are happening each day. I'm thankful for the uh, moms groups that are meeting here throughout the week, four different moms groups. I'm thankful for the, 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 the Christian dance studio, little girls learning how to uh, twirl around and little tutus and stuff. And, and uh, I'm thankful even for yesterday that we could open this facility up and and we could celebrate the life of Pam Hartley. And I believe that, uh, man, what a, great, what a great gathering that was and a great celebration. And so I'm just thankful. I am thankful. But I am reminded that the church is me and you. It's people. There are, uh, there are many, if you haven't noticed already, many churches that can't gather like we can today. There's many that are all through uh, Carolinas, that there is no more buildings. But the beauty of it is, these brothers and sisters are coming together to make the Lord Jesus known. And, uh, and you and I get to be a part of that. That's why I'm wearing the shirt today, if you wondered. Why am I wearing a yellow shirt? Well, it, it's not the most maybe attractive color, but uh, it's to stand out. It's to be visible. Uh, you'll watch different videos, different uh, media outlets. These volunteers won't say necessarily who they're with, because they're representing the Lord Jesus. But Discovery Church, we get to be a part of something so much bigger than just this local expression of the church in Fort Pierce and St. Lucie County, Florida, on the Treasure Coast. We get to be a part of something much greater, much bigger. The kingdom of God is at work. Uh, each month, we write a check to the Florida Baptist Convention, and that, that check funds different ministry opportunities. And one of the ministry opportunities is the Disaster Relief Ministry. This past week, the day after Hurricane Helene went through Perry, Florida, two teams were deployed from this association, from the Treasure Coast Baptist Association. They were deployed to Perry, Florida, and they returned Friday and Saturday. They returned from serving all week, meeting needs, helping cut trees off of homes that had fallen on homes or in the drive. Uh, on the roads, uh, they served meals to people that were hungry, uh, and so I'm so thankful that we get to be a part in one way or another. There will be uh, trips coming up, and if you're interested in going for a week or for a day, would you let me know? Send an email to our uh, to our office uh, or call our office, and we will connect you with the fut a future trip to Perry, Florida. Uh, but I'm thankful that we get to be a part of what God is doing and, and meeting needs. But most importantly, the center of the disaster relief is to share the love of Jesus, the hope 
of Jesus. And we get to be a part of that. If you're a guest today, would you take the connect card that you were handed on the way in? Would you fill that connect card out or scan that QR code in front of you? Scan that QR code in front of you uh, and complete that digital connect card. We want to get to know you. We want to connect with you. On that connect card is an area for prayer. We don't take that lightly. We would love to come alongside of you and pray with you and for you. Would you let us know how we can pray with you and for you? That's found on the connect card. And I would invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 21 as we continue this teaching series titled Short Stories. This teaching series titled Short Stories. Matthew chapter 21. We're going to begin in verse 33. And the main idea today is that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We've already sung about it. Now we're going to read about it. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. If you have your Bibles and if you're able to, would you stand with me as we read this word? And as we read this word, I I want you to consider the characters found in this gospel narrative. Narrative. I want you to consider the characters. We'll see that the landowner is God. We'll see that the vineyard is the people of Israel. We'll see that the tenant farmers are the Jewish religious leaders. We'll see that the servants are the prophets. We'll see that the son is Jesus. And we'll see that the other farmers are the Gentiles. And so look for that as we read. Verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, and dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. He leased it to tenant farmers and went away. When the time came to harvest fruit, he sent his servants to the farmers to collect his fruit. The farmers took his servants, beat one, killed another, And stoned a third. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first group, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent a son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they seized him threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those farmers? Would you pray, Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can stand in reverence, acknowledging that there's only one authority. It is your word, your very word spoken before us. Thank you for this opportunity to gather and to study your word, find great application for our lives. And so give us, give us ears to hear today. Give us eyes to see, hearts to receive, and lives to live out with action. We'll give you all the glory, all the honor. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. May take your seats. I, I, again, the main idea is this, and, and we'll get there, I promise. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Once again, as you're looking at the text before you, and if you need a Bible, we have some in the next steps area. We'd love for you to take a Bible, own it, read it, mark it up. It's yours. It's a gift. But as you read this this parable, this short story, this gospel narrative before us, what we'll see is that the landowner equals God. The vineyard equals the people of Israel. The tenant farmers equals Jewish religious leaders. Uh, The landowner servants equals prophets. The son equals Jesus. And the other tenants or other farmers equals the Gentiles. That's the overview. Now look back to verse 33. What we find in the beginning of this short story, this parable, is that the landowner planted this vineyard. He planted this this vineyard. 
He leased it and he sent his son. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Listen to the words of Isaiah chapter 5 verse 1. I will sing about the one I love. A song about my loved one's vineyard. The one I love had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He broke up the soil, cleared it of stones, and planted it with the finest vines. He built a tower in the middle of it and even dug out a wine press there. He expected it to yield good grapes, but it yielded worthless grapes. So now, residents of Jerusalem and men of Judah, please judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I did? Why, when I expected a yield of good grapes, did it yield worthless grapes? Now I will tell you what I am about to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge. I will remove its covering, its protection, and it will be consumed. I will tear down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland. It will not be pruned or weeded. Thorns or briars will grow up. I will also give orders to the clouds that rain should not fall on it. Verse 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of armies is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, the plant he delighted in, he expected justice and saw injustice. He expected righteousness, but heard cries of despair. The prophet Isaiah prophesies of the people of Israel that they've been called to bear good fruit or good grapes, but... The grapes that they are bearing are worthless grapes. God wants good fruit from our lives. Jesus has already spoken to this in the gospel account of Matthew. He's already spoken to this. He's already charged the disciples to bear good fruit. I wonder, what kind of fruit are you bearing? Between you and the Lord... Take a time of reflection to consider your life. Romans chapter 7 verse 4. Would you write that reference down? Romans 7 verse 4 says this. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. That old life is done. It's, 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 It's death to the old life. You belong to him who raised from the dead in order, listen to this, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Paul's writing to the church in Rome and he's calling the church to bear fruit. This is the purpose. This is why you exist. This is your life. It's to bear good fruit. Jesus had already called the disciples to bear good fruit. This is the same call for your life and my life. We're to bear good fruit. I wonder what kind of fruit are you bearing from your life? What, what evidence to the world is it that you either belong to him or not? And the answer can come all the way back to where we'll end today. Is Jesus the chief cornerstone of your life look to verse 35 of Matthew 21 the farmers took his servants again the servants the prophets and who were the prophets the prophets were men of God called by God to speak to the people of God on behalf of God and call them back to God That's who the prophets were. As we read through the Old Testament, we find major prophets and minor prophets. And and just a quick clarification, they're not minor because they're like less valuable. uh, Or or they're not minor because they were shorter than the other ones, you know. Uh, It's just, they're smaller. It's smaller letters. It's smaller content, right? That's the difference. But they're prophets. They're called by God to speak on behalf of God to the people of God. As you study the prophets, what you're going to see is time and time again, come back to God. 
Repent of your sin, your evil ways, and return to God. That's the message of the prophet speaking on behalf of God. The people of God that have chosen their own way, their own wisdom, their own strength, and failing at it. I know none of you have ever done that. I think we all would agree there are times in our lives that we have missed it. Thank God for his grace and thank God for his patience and thank God that he is the God of second opportunities. But in verse 35, we see the farmers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Right? Everybody's with me now. Like, What's going on? That's, that's the farmers, the tenant farmers, the Jewish religious leaders of the day. Jesus is, 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 is sharing this. And he's speaking to them, by the way. And he says, the farmers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. That they would have known that this was the tragic ending to all the prophets of God. People were really happy of saying, hey, repent of your sins. Why? Because there's moments in my life and in my sin that I want to do what I want to do. Don't call me out. But then we hit the hardest moments of our lives. And we're reminded that we can't do this life on our own. And we desperately need someone or something. And that someone is the living God. In Luke chapter 13 verse 34. Listen to Jesus' cry, his lament. Luke 13, 34, he says this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones? Who kills the prophets and stones? Those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. I wanted to offer you protection, but you were not, you were not willing. Look to verse 36 of Matthew 21. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first group, and they did the same to them. They did the same to them. What, what do we know from this? We, we know this, that the Lord of the vineyard is patient. Can you say amen? Are you thankful that he is a, a, a patient, that God has been patient? I'm thankful. I, man, I can't tell you how many, uh, just ask my wife, uh, how many hard-headed moments, you know, there have been. I'm thankful to God that he is a patient God. He's a loving God. But he sends them again. He gave them opportunities through the prophets to repent of their ways. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6. Would you write that reference down? Isaiah 55, verse 6 says this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Verse 7. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will freely forgive. Do you see this about our God? Oh, don't miss it. Yes, indeed, our God is a just God. He is a just God. But he's also a loving God. Gives opportunities. This day that you're experiencing, this moment, this breath, is only because the living God has given it to us. But you see the call from this Old Testament prophet Isaiah, return to the Lord. Listen to uh, Hosea, right? write that reference down, Hosea 14, another Old Testament prophet. Hosea 14, verse 1, Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. What is that? Sin? Your sin? You've stumbled in your own sin? Take, verse 2, take words of repentance with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our iniquity, forgive all our sin, and accept what is good so that we may repay you with praise from our lips. Old Testament prophet Joel calls the people, uh, Hosea calls the people of God to return to the Lord. Joel chapter 2 verse 12, 
Listen, even now, this is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. Do do, do you hear this? These Old Testament prophets of God calling the people of God back to God. Repent of your ways and return to the Lord. Find true forgiveness. Find compassion in him. That's the call. And so we see from this this, this short story, this parable, this gospel narrative that as Jesus shares that the, the Lord of the vineyard is patient. He gives opportunities to return. Verse 37, we see uh, again, uh, finally, he sent his son to them. And this is what he says. They will respect my son, he said. They, They will respect my son. Listen to Mark, the gospel of Mark's account to this verse. Mark chapter 12, verse 6. He still had one to send. A beloved son. A beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. A beloved son. Only begotten son. Jesus would come and would be crucified. So that you and I might have life. Look to verse 38. But when the tenant farmer saw the son. They said to each other. This is the heir. Come. Let's worship him. Come. Let's bow down before him. Come. Let's celebrate him. No they don't say that. What do they say? Come. Let's kill him. Let's kill him. That's their response. At least eight times we read in the gospel accounts. People tried to seize Jesus and kill him. At least eight times we we read, as we read through the gospels, we find that. See, here's the reality. In their hearts, they hated Jesus because they knew he really was the Messiah. In their hearts, the religious leaders of the day hated Jesus because they knew he really was the Messiah. Who is this that can speak with authority? Who is this that can do these great signs and these miracles? Who is this that people would come from all different regions just to get a glimpse and just to touch the hem of his garment? Something about him. Charles Spurgeon wrote, they caught him in the garden of Gethsemane. They cast him out in their council in the hall of Caiaphas. And when he was led without the gate, led without the gate of Jerusalem, they slew him at Calvary. Look to verse 41. He will completely destroy these, those terrible men, they told him. And lease his vineyard to other farmers who will give him his fruit at the harvest. Now this is the response of the religious leaders of the day. They didn't really know what they were saying. They would want to hold on to that vineyard. They didn't realize the other tenants that that they're referring to would be the Gentiles. Uh, There there would be this, this partial hardening of the heart of the Jewish people of this day. But this is their response to Jesus. That what should happen is there should be complete utter destruction. That those who rebel against their master this way deserve judgment. But they didn't realize that they were speaking about themselves. Verse 42. Jesus responds. Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
This is what the Lord has done, and it is wonderful in our eyes. Jesus responds with a, a familiar text. It would have been familiar to the religious leaders of the day. He responds with a text from Psalm chapter 1, uh, 118. Listen to the words. Verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord. It is wondrous in our sight. Then listen to verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus responds to the religious leaders of the day by quoting a familiar passage. Now buildings in, in, in this day and even until this day in this land were built out of stone. And the cornerstone that the psalmist refers to that Jesus quotes the cornerstone was the most important part of the building. I wonder today, what have you tried to build your life upon? What have you tried to build your home upon? The people would have understood what Jesus was referring to. They would have understood the, the basic operation, the basic procedure uh, of building a home. They would have understood how important this cornerstone would have been. The psalmist is prophesying of Jesus. Jesus is quoting the psalmist and referring to himself. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Acts chapter 2, Jesus has ascended into heaven. Peter and the disciples stand before the crowd that gathered on the southern steps of Jerusalem that day. And, and it's the first recorded evangelical message that we have where Peter boldly preaches this message. And if you've read, you, you recall 3,000 were added to the church that day. It's the start of the church. Then in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested. Why? Because the religious leaders are like, hey, there's too many, there's too many things happening. There's too many people coming to this, to this faith, coming to this belief system. We better do something. We better put these guys in prison that, that are the leading cause of this. So, so they bring these guys, Peter and John, they arrest them and bring them before the council and listen to the response to Acts chapter 4 verse 9. If we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, verse 10, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before, here before you healthy. This, Jesus, verse 11, is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. Verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. What boldness. What boldness. Peter and John standing before the council, standing before the religious leaders of the day, being questioned about this man being healed and, and the boldness to stand before them, knowing that it could have meant death. Verse 43 says, therefore, I, uh, Matthew 21, therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a, a people producing its fruit. Jesus is responding back to the religious leaders of the day in verse 43. Israel hardened their hearts. Jesus was rejected by the nation. So God rejected the nation. Uh, this would not be permanent though. 
Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Would you write that reference down? Romans 11, 25 says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you will not be conceited. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, scholars will debate the end times. We've looked to the end times a few weeks ago if you're with us. But during the tribulation, we see this number of 144,000 people. And who is it? I believe that the 144,000 people refers to Jews that will receive Jesus during this tribulation. Why do I say that? Well, you can study for yourself, but Revelation chapter 7, verse 5, beginning in verse 5, states the 12 tribes of Israel and that there will be 12,000 from each one. And you do the math. And you come up with a number of 144,000 Jewish people. There, there may be a partial hardening, but there's coming a day where people will see Jesus for who he really is. That Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is the Savior of the world. Verse 44, chapter 21 Whoever falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will be shattered. It will be shattered. Opposition to Jesus is injury to ourselves. Anytime I've gone against God's plan, it's only meant injury for me. Anytime we go against God's plan, it's injury for you. We have a list of how we should conduct ourselves written before us in this holy book, but we also have a Holy Spirit living inside of us, guiding us into truth of how we should conduct our lives. And, and once again, we're to bear fruit. And not just any kind of fruit, but good fruit. We're called to bear good fruit. The question is this, how are you building the foundation of your life? Unless Jesus is the chief cornerstone of your life, you will not bear good fruit. You can try your hardest, you can work till you're dead, but unless Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, it will be in vain. And so I wonder, those in the house, those online today, do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Do you know him as Lord and Savior? Have you rejected him as the Jewish leaders did? And how are you building the foundation of your life? As we begin to close today, I, I want... I want all the parents in the house to consider this. Of course, I want everyone to consider this, but more importantly, I want the parents in the house to consider this because God has gifted you and God has entrusted you with children, a younger generation. And I wonder what, what example are you setting for them? What will you pass on to them? What will they see in you? Will they see the... The fake Christian, you know, the one that shows up to church and everything is all good and it's all smiles and then you get in that car and there's nothing but hell and uh, to be described. And I mean, what do they see in you? What do they see behind the closed doors? Oh, the call. The call is so important to lead well, to point your children to Jesus, to live a life that will honor the Lord. 
Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 says this. So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Is Jesus the cornerstone of your life? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all, all across this place? If you're online with us, would you do the same? Don't turn it off just yet. Would you, would you take a moment to consider your life? I'm reminded of how precious life is. And even yesterday, gathering here, celebrating Pam Hartley's life, I'm reminded of how we don't know. We really don't know if that next day is guaranteed. But we know what's before us right now. I wonder if there's someone here today there's a believer in the house or online with us today that would say, Tim, I, I need to repent and return to the Lord. I haven't been honoring him with my life. There's no good fruit being produced from my life. And so today I want to recommit to following Jesus. Hey, if that's your prayer, would you make that commitment before the Lord? Right here, right now, would you make that commitment before the Lord? I wonder if there's someone here today that's never surrendered their life over to Jesus. If you were to die right now, you don't know where you would spend eternity, but according to the Word of God and on His authority, you can know, you can be assured. And so if that's you, right here, right now, would you confess Jesus you are Lord of my life. You are Lord of my life. Jesus, I believe that you came to this earth. You died on a cross. You were placed in a grave and you rose victorious for me, I believe. That's your confession today. Would you say something like this? Forgive me of all my sins. I trust you as Lord and Savior of my life. I commit today to follow you all the days of my life. If that's you, would you thank him for saving you? In a moment, we're going to sing. We're going to sing a final song. And as we sing this song, there's going to be men and women at the different corners of this room. If you're online, there's, there's a host that would love to pray with you online. But I want to encourage you, whatever your decision is today, would you have the courage to step out of that seat and come pray? Men with men, ladies with ladies, would you, would you have the courage to step out of your seat and come allow someone just to pray for you and with you on whatever your commitment is with the Lord today? Jesus, we love you, and we thank you, and we celebrate you, and we simply say to you, be all the glory and all the honor. Help our yes to be yes today. Help us to follow you all the days of, of our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus. For your glory we pray. Amen.